Daniel Schmartenberger, thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. So you're a philosopher, founding member of the Consilience Project. The goal of uh, this conversation today is to analyze the direction uh, our civilization is taking in half an hour. Because uh, you've been doing like so many great podcasts about the um, meta crisis during uh, lasting three to four hours. And uh, I suggest that people go and watch them on the uh, on internet. They're very good. We start with the harvest of the day, the question I'm asking to all the guests here uh, for Harvest Podcast. Uh, if something easy or simple could be done and uh, would make the world a better place, what would it be for you, Daniel? When I saw the note that you sent me, that that would be a last question. Is there a simple or easy thing that everyone could do that make the world a better place? I kind of cringed because I usually really am not a fan of that question because the world needs so many different kinds of things done that require different skills and capacities and orientations. And to try to reduce it to some thing that would be true for everybody, you get a platitude like be kind or loving or something like that, <clears throat> or you get something like recycle or pick up trash or try to use less carbon or something that doesn't map to the whole set of things that the world needs. I think there's a process where movements have been associated with political processes and markets in a way that it's like, here's this great catastrophe that will happen if the other side gets elected. So everybody needs to get out and vote for so-and-so. And that's like, a, everybody can do a simple thing because we're relating to everybody as voters. Um, or everybody donate to this cause or boycott this thing. But the complexity of the world's issues from climate issues to AI risk to supply chain issues to electrical grid issues, like there's no action like that. There's no somebody to vote for or not to vote for or thing to donate to that addresses it. One thing that is not necessarily easy but is relatively simple that would be great if everybody in the world could do more is to seek to try to understand other people's perspectives much more deeply, particularly those that are most different than their own. Uh, if you can try to take the opposite perspective on abortion, on gun control, on climate change, on the Ukraine-Russian war, on the Chinese versus Western system, on any of those things, on the Israel-Palestine issue. If you can try to earnestly be able to make the argument that the person on the other side would make as well enough that they don't have anything to add to it. And not just as a rhetorical process, but connect to the values that they care about and what it feels like to be them and see the world through their eyes, realizing that there might be distortion. There might be a lot of things missing, but there's not zero truth or zero value to it. That process, if everyone did that, would actually result in Uh, addressing the meta crisis in all of its complexity, the issues in synthetic biology risk and pandemics and escalation pathways to warfare and economic issues and geopolitical issues and all of them, because you can kind of say that they either come down to conflict or externalities. Like we cause harm directly intentionally, which a war is a great example of, uh, or harm gets caused that we didn't intend to cause. So no one intended to cause climate change. We just wanted to have transportation and energy and the secondary you know, byproduct of that was climate change. Uh, all of the environmental issues, no one intentionally had a conflict with the environment that was causing it. It was the externality of optimizing something and causing harm somewhere else. And so <laughs> there are problems that we intentionally cause and there are problems that we accidentally cause. Both of them would be corrected by seeking to understand all the perspectives more because If you sought to understand the perspectives well enough, conflict theory would evaporate. And most of the mistakes, when you're trying to optimize for one thing and you end up causing externalities to something else, somebody else saw that and knew that. And if you were in wide enough conversations, then the thing that you're trying to optimize for that's going to cause harm somewhere else, someone else would have mentioned and said, actually, let's improve your design or your strategy by factoring this. So both the unintentional externalities and the intentional conflict would be resolved through active perspective seeking and then perspective synthesis. Wonderful. Um, when you look at the history, as you said, like humans seem to have like a talent for um, innovation and progress, but also a natural tendency for war and uh, chaos. Um, these two tendencies feed each other and uh, make things 
bigger and bigger. So greatest but out of control technologies can cause a huge damage. What do you think um, should be about uh, should be done about uh, technologies and uh, do they represent like uh, innovation or uh, danger for you? First thing about technology is that even if we're not talking about a military technology, we're talking about a technology for some other purpose. Even if we develop a technology for some non-military purpose, it will have a military application or some kind of conflict-oriented application. The, basically saying all technologies dual use. So <clears throat> maybe we're doing the synthetic biology gene editing for trying to cure cancer, but as we get better at making tools to do gene editing, can that be used for bioweapons? Totally. Um, maybe we're making the AI to try to do drug discovery, but can that same AI do autonomous drones? And of course it can. Whatever purpose we're developing technology for, we're also making that technology cheaper and easier for all other types of purposes simultaneously. And that's a huge thing we have to factor. Mm -hmm. From a conflict point of view, obviously uh, people with Stone Age technology can't cause a war that blows the world up. And people with Bronze Age technology can't cause a war that blows the world up. The, mm -hmm. the harm is proportional to the amount of tech. So as we move into exponentially more powerful tech, um, we can't continue to use it with the types of conflict orientation and irresponsibility we used previous tech. The other thing is that even when we're not using tech for intentionally conflict-oriented purposes, all of the tech we use does externalize harm in different ways. So, you know, whether we're talking about agricultural technology where the nitrogen fertilizer fed a lot of people but also causes all the dead zones in the ocean and soil erosion and biodiversity loss, um, exponentially more technology also means exponentially more externalities. And so we can't handle exponential war and we can't handle exponential externalities. So we have to change our relationship with technology really fundamentally and say, <clears throat> no other animal had the ability to destroy the biosphere that it depends upon. We now do. We did not for all of human history, so we didn't have to really wrestle with that power. We did kill and enslave and genocide and every previous civilization doesn't still exist because they all ended up collapsing mostly for reasons that were largely self-induced. Even when wars happened, oftentimes a war that overtook a civilization was from an enemy that was uh, less powerful than ones that they had vanquished in their prime. They had already went through some internal institutional decay from infighting and things like that. Many early civilizations died from environmentally induced causes. They cut down all the trees, they um, overstripped the soil of nutrients. So civilizational breakdown is actually the norm. It's just never been at a global level. Now we don't live in the United States or China. We live in a place where the cell phone that we're watching this on or the computer we're watching it on took six continent supply chains to make communicating via satellites. And so we live in a kind of global civilization where none of the countries are actually autonomous for the fundamental things that they need. Now that we do have the ability to destroy the biosphere, either very rapidly through exponential technology like synthetic biology or AI or war warfare, or kind of slowly through the limits of growth and environmental issues, but that's not all that slow. If you have the power to destroy the nature that you depend upon, you have to consciously steward it or you'll self-terminate. So um, the gist is we don't have evolutionary capacities. We have trans-evolutionary capacities, meaning... But a difference, yeah. Yeah, so, and I'm meaning evolution in a biologic evolution sense. <clears throat> so another animal has the capacities that it has corporeally built into its body based on its genes. So a predator can't become radically more predatory quickly is only through genetic mutation that maybe it becomes slightly faster or has slightly bigger teeth and then it's going to be a relatively small change and then there will be co-selection the slightly more effective predator will eat the slightly slower prey so which means that the faster prey genes and breed and you get this kind of co-selective process okay we through our ability to build tools and then tools on tools right recursive abstraction if you look at a true apex predator you look at an orca in the ocean an orca maybe can catch one fish at a time, one tuna at a time. Then you look at a trawling boat that has a mile-long drift net that can pull up 100,000 fish at once. We're not apex predators. 
Mm -hmm. right? Like yeah. it's wrong to think of us as apex predators. We have uh, power that is not encoded in our bodies, extracorporeal technological capacity. You look at a nuclear bomb explosion versus a pissed off polar bear. They're not similar levels of destructive capacity. Yeah. Um, so since we have beyond evolutionary capacity, we actually have to have beyond evolutionary motive to guide that capacity. And if you want to say that mythopoetically, it's if you have the power of gods and by gods here, like, I mean, little g, right? I, I mean, it mythopoetically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Meaning Superpowers. Jeanette, you, you can make species extinct. You can destroy ecosystems. You can create an Anthropocene where the largest effect on the geology of the planet is human activity. You can genetically engineer new species, right? That's much closer to the power of gods than it is the power of an apex predator. If you don't also have the love and wisdom of gods and prudence of gods to guide it, it doesn't go well. And so, uh, you know, that is just another way of saying if you have recursive abstraction on tools that gives us, and tools and coordination, that give us the radically more than evolutionary capacity to affect the world, we have to move into trans-evolutionary motive, which means the same recursive abstraction that we're doing right now saying, oh yeah, I guess it makes sense that we can't run an exponential financial system that's attached to a linear materials economy that takes stuff out of nature faster than it can be replenished and turns it into trash and pollution in nature faster than it can be processed. You can't do that exponentially forever on a finite planet, so we have to do something fundamentally different, which means you can't orient towards continued maximized growth and maximized conflict orientation forever. So that's what I mean by a trans-evolutionary motive. Okay. Is it naive to think um, that we need a global uh, governance and we can make a global governance? When you look at the problem of countries having competitive dynamics with each other where nobody wants to price carbon properly because if they do, their own economy will be so damaged relative to whoever doesn't that the radically decreased geopolitical power will express itself as less military power, less trade power. And particularly with whoever is at the leading edge of guiding the world system, this classic, you know, the U.S. isn't going to if China doesn't and vice versa. And um, so then everyone is mostly actually just in a an economics race that is also bound to a an actual arms race. Yeah. And so, and that's true for pricing carbon and climate change. It's also true for fishing of the oceans and aerosols and on and on and on. So if you have an issue like the atmosphere, right? It, it, aerosols in the atmosphere and ozone layer, or you have an issue like the oceans or climate change, no country can solve that problem. And any country that does the thing that is doing its share, that is economically disadvantaged in the short term by doing it, it just isn't going to do that if everyone else doesn't because they are caught in the competitive dynamics. So when, you look, eaten, yeah. so when you look at that, you're like, all right, well, we need global government because we have global issues. We don't just have national issues. And you have to have governance at the level that you have issues. But then, of course, most thinking people aren't really a big fan of the idea of global government because it's not a great idea to have unchecked power, though we don't have a good history of being good stewards of unchecked power. And so, like, you know, in many modern governments in the United States, it was kind of like the foundation of the whole idea was let's separate church and state, let's separate the judicial branch and the legislative branch and the executive branch, let's even separate the legislative branches in the separate houses. Let's like let's try to create as much check and balance on power as possible. Yeah. So if you had a one world government that had enough power to be able to price carbon properly and enforce fishing laws and et cetera, how do you prevent it from becoming corrupted or captured? And so we need global government and we don't want global government. And so <laughs> th this is this like You, you have catastrophes on one hand that need to be avoided, and yeah. that typically looks like more control mechanisms of things that if you don't control will lead to catastrophe. And the control mechanisms typically lead to dystopias. And so we want something that is not catastrophes or dystopias. We kind of call this the third attractor. And that means you have to have control mechanisms that prevent catastrophes, but you have to have checks and balances on the power within those. How do you do that? So global governance and global government are not the same thing. Right, global government, the idea that there's some centralized global monopoly of violence, it's a bad idea. Okay. The idea that there is some more effective process of global coordination, even whether it's a more effective process of nations engaging 
and multilateral agreements that can be facilitated by technology that can make uh, the participation or violation of those agreements more transparent or you know there is some process of global governance that has to occur mm -hmm. where th there's both eff effective power for enforcement this is why you know we can solve those types of coordination problems to some degree those race to the bottom within a country where you have a monopoly of violence because the law and monopoly of violence just basically says, no, you're not allowed to cut down any of those trees. That's a national park. And if you try, the police will stop you and they have mm -hmm. more capacity for violence yeah. than you do. With international issues where you don't actually have international enforcement, it's really, really tricky. So for all of the really global issues, and that looks like it's in each nation's interests to burn the coal as fast as it can and the oil. It's in each nation's interests to win the AI arms race, even though that increases the likelihood that we all die from it in the long term. So global governance that has appropriate checks and balances is a tricky topic, but it's a necessary topic. What gives you hope today? A lot of things give me hope. I have noticed in my own work, people in uh, top positions of power and in major institutions that affect the world being radically more aware of things that are fundamentally unviable about this world system and interested in deeper changes and actually starting to try to implement some things just even in the last couple of years than I had ever experienced previously. So the idea that, you know, the, the kind of behavior that individuals can do on their own matters and the kind of stuff we can do locally like you know, prototyping new types of communities and new types of cities. Um, you don't solve climate change in time and you don't solve planetary boundaries in time and you don't solve AI risk that way, right? That requires kind of agreement from existing top-down organizations. They can't actually innovate a new world. They can just stop bad things from happening with the right kinds of agreements. To innovate a new world actually does require local um, and more participatory activity. Uh, but the fact that after COVID and after the extreme uh, political polarization that uh, has happened and after how much of Australia burned and then flooded and, um, you know, now with the war in Ukraine. And I think there was a situation where previously people who were thinking about it and who were prescient realized this world system is destabilizing and is fundamentally not sustainable. Most of the people who are administrating it didn't think that. Now, almost everybody thinks that. And that's actually something that gives me hope. Great. Uh, how much time do we have to react to avoid extinction? Well, some species go extinct every day as a result of human activity. So for them, uh, we're already past existential risk. You know, Kiev was an incredibly progressive place not very long ago. It wouldn't have seemed like a place where imminent catastrophic risk was uh, was coming for many people. And, um, you know, that's even true of Syria not that long ago. And um, you see the pictures of what culture was like in 1968 in Iran. So it's not like how long do we have before catastrophe hits? We're already in a rolling global catastrophe. Like how long does Australia have before it burns that already happened? How, you know, and from extreme weather events that are a result of human-induced activity, poor environmental management, and problems with utility companies and overuse of groundwater and climate change, right? And how quickly does war escalate as a result of what's happening in Ukraine at larger scale and already what we see in regarding Taiwan and Azerbaijan and Armenia and Iran and so many places? Um, these things could move very fast or more slowly in ways that are chaotic and totally unpredictable. Um, when you look at things like uh, the planetary boundaries, how long until we pass certain planetary boundaries, you'll hear people talk about this thing happens in 2050 and this thing happens in, by the end of the century or whatever with climate change. But we've already passed some of the cl planetary boundaries. You know, there's a study just published in the American Chemical Society Journal saying that um, 
certain toxic chemicals in rainwater kind of ubiquitous around the world are past the EPA thresholds for human health. And this was particularly the, um, the fluorinated surfactants, which don't break down, right? That's why they call them forever chemicals. But the idea that things that are carcinogens and cause birth defects and are endocrine disruptors in rainwater all around the world are past the levels of human health tolerability is a huge deal. It means even if you go get off grid as can be and try to live off the land, you can't. And, um, and how quickly we're producing those chemicals, not only is there a cumulative effect of them because they're persistent, but we're also increasing our production of them exponentially. And so how long do we have? We're already in a situation of a breakdown of a world system. It's already existential for many species. It's already catastrophic for people in many areas of the world. And so I would reorient the question to be more like, is there anything that we can do to have it not be totalizing? And the answer is yes. And the answer time-wise on that is the full life attention of everyone as best as possible, directed at better understanding the issues and participating in their solutions is what's required. In an uh, individual level, uh, we've become a bit lazy, maybe, maybe because we think like there is always a solution and we don't really need to act. Um, how to wake up and also how do you get the news? Because you have like so many news in different directions, like we don't know who to believe and we don't know, like we're not sure we need to act because things always uh, have a solution by themselves. There's a really interesting book called The Politics of the Invisible written after Chernobyl because after the Chernobyl explosion, the uranium is invisible, right? You can't see it with the human eye. Obviously now COVID is invisible and yet totally lethal. And what he was exploring in Politics of the Invisible is because of modern technology and chemistry, uh, we can make things that are totally lethal that we can't see, that require people with Geiger counters and the ability to do physics that not everyone can do uh, to be able to determine safety levels. How does that work with democracy when most people don't have the capacity to do that? So you'll see currently a lot of people doubting climate change science, but nobody can actually, the average citizen can't run the IPCC's mathematical models to say yeah. they work or they don't work or they... Mm -hmm. Um, and so people are largely kind of left to faith and you then end up getting uh, politics driving people to either be kind of pro-institutional or anti-institutional and, um, and the institutions get things wrong. So it's easy to be anti-institutional mm -hmm. and yeah. neither of the positions are actually viable. And there is something other than truth, which is the movement to power motivated in both of them. I see that when people think someone else will come up with a solution, they feel kind of unmotivated. But also when people think there is no solution, they feel unmotivated. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is also something I find really interesting is when I talk to someone who has a really fervent, adamant view about whatever it is that, whether it's vaccines or m masks or what should happen in Russia, Ukraine or abortion law or whatever, um, they go from complete certainty without understanding the position of the other side or all the complexity or nuance well. And if I challenge it enough, regardless of which side it is, and show them the increased complexity, okay, well, if we price carbon that way and China doesn't, then autocracy ends up running the world, so you're voting democracy out, and whatever it is. Then <clears throat> for so many people, the first response when you increase the, show them that the way they're thinking about it doesn't actually map to the complexity of the problem, they go from utter certainty to nihilism in one yeah. step. They're like, oh, fuck it. It's too hard. It's too complex. I give up. And the, to move from certainty to nihilism in one step is so damn lazy, like cognitively, emotionally, epistemically lazy. And so I want people to go from certainty to like, actually, I don't understand this all that well. Actually, climate change or global science or policy on this thing is pretty complex. There are experts who spent their whole life working on it who disagree. That doesn't mean there aren't solutions, but <clears throat> the one that was fed to me that everybody on my political side agrees with and everyone on the other side disagrees with is probably not a fair version of the whole truth. So I'm not going to give up because I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to hold the certainty that I know because I don't. I'm going to work to try to understand competently while recognizing I don't yet. And then even once I get to 
much deeper understanding, I'll still recognize how much stuff I don't know that's relevant and new information that might come in. So I want people to be much more epistemically rigorous and epistemically humble at the same time, right? Epistem epistemology meaning how we go about knowing things. So <laughs> I want them to work much harder at trying to come to understand while having much less certainty about their current level of understanding. So when you ask how do you, like what sources should people go to for news or whatever, the ones they don't currently go to is the first answer. Um, and mm -hmm. then of course, progressively better sources, not all the sources independent of political spin are, are equally good. But when you can see where do the various earnest experts on a topic disagree, and you at least understand those positions pretty well, then you start to have a sense of the topic. As a philosopher, and because you spoke about politics, do you want uh, to stay away from politics or are you into politics? Politics meaning how people organize and how they coordinate and how they make sense of the world together so they can make choices together. No, I'm, I'm totally focused on that. Um, the current political system in the United States does not do a very good job of helping people collectively make sense of issues well, collectively identify all the values that matter, that are shared values, and then collectively make good choices in the presence of the shared sense-making and shared values generation. So um, it's not that I think there is never a time to engage in voting for a particular candidate or on a particular proposition, but how to engage in metapolitics, meaning how to evolve this political system and economic system, right? How to evolve the political economy along with evolving the infrastructure and tech stack and the culture and value system simultaneously, because all three of those interaffect each other, right? The, the culture, the political economy, and the infrastructure and technology, they all interaffect each other. So you can't change any of them without changing all of them to think through how to, what has to happen in all of those for a viable world to come about. I'm very interested in that. Okay. Um, let's speak a bit uh, about you. Something very um, interesting I found. Um, you mentioned you were um, homeschooled by your parents. Um, which qualities uh, did your parents manage to let flourish in you that might not have been um, so important or so uh, in the traditional education when you're changing teachers every year? I was homeschooled. Uh, I did go to school. Um, both private and public schools for little bits throughout my life. So I have some experience of it, but most of my childhood was homeschooled. But it was not uh, traditional homeschooling, meaning I didn't have the state curriculum and just do it at home. My parents were kind of interested in running an educational experiment that uh, is a little bit closer to what people call unschooling today, but there was just no curriculum. It was just... Okay. Um, what, they of, felt, what they felt you need to, to learn. It's not what they felt. Their hypothesis was um, expose the kids to all the different topics, see which ones they're interested in, facilitate their interest, and kind of trust that. And so it's aligned with some of the ideas of Montessori and Dewey yeah. and constructivism. And um, But, you know, radical to have no curriculum at all. But, uh, and I'm not saying that is what I would advise, but there's a lot good in that. And what qualities that facilitated in me that um, most educational systems don't is all of my studies were things I was interested in. And so my interest in learning was actually growing all the time, right? There was never a place where I wanted to get out of school and go play or do something else where uh, learning felt like a burden or where I ended up not having any negative association with study and I had only positive association with it because I was studying things I wanted to study. So um, I find that people tend to become good at things they really enjoy. And so facilitating, like even if you have a curriculum, really paying attention to where a student's interests are and where their passions are. And If there's a topic that isn't appealing to them, trying to find a way that actually has it really appeal as opposed to just force them to do the thing makes a huge difference, not to their learning of that topic, but to their relationship to learning itself. What a special event that put you on this path of um, trying to see the truth, what's happening and uh, observe the complexity of the world. 
lots and lots of events. I mean, some some people have a, a near death experience turning point that is really kind of singular. I I think most people's life path unfolds from lots of things. Um, so as I'm mentioning, being homeschooled by parents who are obviously kind of interested in childhood development and uh, the books my parents read to me as bedtime stories were Buckminster Fuller's Design Science and Fritjof Capra's Systems Theory and, um, you know, Eastern Vedic philosophy and things like that. So <clears throat> there were um, people who were thinking about what is the world? How does the world work? How do we integrate across the various philosophic and scientific traditions? Uh, how do we improve civilization? Those were kind of like just the core thoughts. That, and so I, I didn't really have to get on that path. Um, and then a big part of my study as a kid was not just studying various areas of philosophy or science or whatever, but also being actively engaged in activism. My mom was particularly into kind of hands-on activism with uh, whether it was helping animals at the local animal shelter or larger kind of factory farm animal rights issues or uh, environmental issues. And um, so being engaged in activism and then seeing what the problems in the world were and then similarly having a system science and kind of design science background to look at it and say, how are these problems interconnected? What do they have in common as generative dynamics? What would it take to address them more comprehensively? Because it's not that hard to see that whether we're talking about issues in healthcare or issues in war, issues in politics or issues in the environment, things like perverse economic incentive are one of the drivers of all of them. So it's like, well, how do we think through an economic system that doesn't have perverse incentive? Yeah, I would say it was working across many different areas of activism, seeing how they related, seeing why the solutions that we were working on weren't adequate because they didn't address the deeper dynamics. Um, those were kind of key early things for me. Thank you very much, Daniel. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>